Uh, hi, I'm Mimansa and uh, I'm I'm presently doing my undergraduate and from the past three years my research topic has always revolved around sentiment analysis and its application in various domains. Uh, last year I finally settled upon using sentiment analysis in uh, healthcare, especially related to psychological issues and today I would not be going into the um, coding techniques, but mostly an overview about what are the basic criteria uh, of uh, sentiment analysis and what are the basic NLP techniques and what are the basic packages in Python libraries you can use to perform those tasks. Uh, this is the outline of the talk, so it will start with introduction and then NLTK and the sen sentiment labeling task and the use of sentiment analysis and sentiment in healthcare. So what is natural language processing? Um, it's basically the requirement that you re you read something, but if you are a one-year-old child, you cannot recognize what you are reading. But if you are, say, a 10-year-old child, you can recognize much more of what you are reading. So a computer has no intelligence, as we have always known. So how to make it learn to read natural language and to summarize the natural language, basically? So how can it know the grammar? How can it know the context? How can it understand what it is basically supposed to say? What is the language supposed to say? So uh, why do we actually process natural language using computers if human can process it that well? So that task is basically uh, for question and answering systems, as well as um, you need to convert a human interface. Like if, um, if there's a Facebook post that is targeted at you, towards you, so that post needs to know what your reactions are. And if there are millions of people on that social media website, there's a very less chance that every uh, post would be read, every comment would be read by the creator of that website. So he needs to know the general opinion of the inclination towards the, of the project, towards the ad, etc. So that's why we go with natural language processing. So now what is sentiment analysis? So sentiment analysis is basically identifying and like characterizing a basic unit of text. Sentiment analysis initially was just towards positive or negative or neutral, but these days it is combined with emotion analysis, so it aims to refer to whether you are angry or whether you are sad or whether you are happy through your, through your texts and posts and Twitter data and comments as well. So what can a sentiment analyst uh, answer? So say uh, there's a movie that has been released recently and there's a huge uproar on Twitter about it. So I can mine the Twitter data and understand whether the sentiment towards the movie is basically positive or negative or what is it positive about. Say the graphics, are, like if you write on Twitter that the graphics are good but the storyline is so weak. So I wouldn't go through each post on Twitter as a movie maker to know whether what was good or what was weak. So we need the computer to state that, okay, uh, most of the people say that the graphics was good, so we didn't need to improve on that. But uh, most of the people say that the storyline was weak, and that is the main, main point of improvement. And that is what is called as topic modeling. So... Um, this is basically also used in project reviews, movie reviews, um, ad targets, social media marketing, etc. This is the core, um, the, actually the preliminary application of uh, sentiment analysis. So anyone who starts with sentiment analysis basically uses a movie data set and uh, tries to capture that, okay, if this is the text written in the data set, can we predict the ratings that the user wanted to give to this movie? What isn't easy about uh, natural language processing as compared to computer vision is basically the inaccuracy of human perception. So given an uh, image of a cat, if I show it to say hundreds of people, uh, I have a 99.99% chance that everyone would say that it's a cat. Uh, given a piece of text which has around 10 to 20 lines in a text, um, Say if it's a novel, 
uh, if I show it to some literary authors or people who are, have a good background in English literature, they would find metaphors in it which, uh, which delve into deep context, whereas if I show it to some other person, he might take it on its face value. So the problem with uh, natural language processing tasks or uh, implementations is basically that uh, every task we have, uh, the human accuracy doesn't go over 80%. So if I have a tweet, and if I ask 100 people whether this is positive or negative, uh, humans themselves don't tend to agree 20% of the time. So that is a basic problem for machine. How can I feed a data set to a machine where the data set is wrong 20% of the time itself? So this is a very common Kelvin Hope's um, comic. It, uh, it is about Hobbes asking Kelvin whether he likes a new girl in the class, and Kelvin actually answers in negative. But I'm pretty sure you can understand that the answer is not negative. He does actually like the girl in the class. Now, if I feed this conversation into a computer, it would probably result that Kelvin is not interested in the girl. But whereas we need to know that, okay, these responses that have been articulated by Kelvin are actually sarcastic in nature rather than being definitive in nature. So what are the challenges? The challenges are basically like sarcasm detection, metaphor detection, and one of the most um, challenging tasks in data cleaning related to sentiment analysis is text speak. Uh, when Twitter creates a text limit of 140 characters, we don't tend to shorten our argument. We tend to shorten the words we write in the argument. So if I want to write a 200 character post, I wouldn't find another word for it. I would rather write letters mixed with numbers, which might mean something to someone who knows the SMS language, but to a computer who only understands dictionary and text, it would actually mean nothing. It would be a word which would mean nothing because it wouldn't correspond to any word in the dictionary. So how do we do that? And how do we process simple English text in Python? Uh, the basic module for processing text in Python is NLTK. So, um, it provides an easy to use interface with corpora and lexical resources. Uh, it also provides some basic classification and it provides a very good implementation of tokenization and stemming tagging from the Stanford parser. So um, there are many corpus in NLTK, one of the corpus being the movie review corpus, one of the corpus being the brown corpus, and you can directly use those corpus by say import NLTK nltk.download and when you do nltk.download it, it opens up a GUI interface where you can uh, click the checkboxes to download the corpus you want and then uh, like in this example if you download the nltk corpus brown you can actually see the words directly from the corpus and perform analysis on it rather than cleaning the data set yourself for the big like for the initial task so what are the simple things that you can do with nltk um, one of them is POS tagging. So POS tagging refers to part of speech tagging. How, why is it necessary? So when it is related to sentiment analysis, most of the sentiment in a sentence is in the adjective of the st statement. So he's a bad person, he's a good person, I'm having a great time. The identifier which actually defines whether it's a good statement, a positive reaction or negative reaction is in the adjective of that statement. So POS tagging basically helps us to define the sentence structure and the context. So if uh, I'm putting in a statement, NL, uh, with NLTK you can directly use word tokenized function and put in a sentence and it would return you the words with their corresponding part of speech tags. From these words you can directly use the adjectives. You can also, uh, later we would see how we can use the conjunctions to define rules whether uh, which word is important and which word is not. So uh, conjunctions like uh, the service was terrible, but the rooms were, uh, but the rooms were clean. Has uh, if I directly uh, take the words 
terrible and clean into consideration and add them up, it would lead to, lead to a neutral reaction. But what it is basically need, saying that the first statement is a negative one and after but the second part of the statement is a positive one. So how do we do that? To find the conjunctions, we also use POS tagging. Uh, it can display parse trees directly and one of the basic purposes of using NLTK is also stemming. So uh, how do you convert plurals to singular? So like um, if we, en uh, we can import a stemmer and then like uh, I'm putting a list into of plurals and uh, say flies is a plural and how to convert it into fly or um, and say boys is a plural, how to convert it into boy. Why is it necessary is basically for finding out what the person is speaking about. So say the person is speaking about graphics in a movie review and he says the graphics were good, where graphics is a plural, and the other person is saying that the graphic integration was good, where graphic is singular, but both of them refer to the same thing. But if we use uh, any, like, any model directly, it would consider graphics and graphic to be two different words and apply different rules on them. So we first need to convert all plurals to singular to manage them in one context itself. Then there is something called as named entity recognition, which is basically used for deciding whether a um, particular phrase or a word is a proper noun or a general noun. So proper nouns are basically names or places or say um, monuments or things like that. So uh, named entity recognition is necessary for, um, you can say it's necessary for creating uh, an identification about what the person is speaking. So if a tweet is about a politician and we have performed named entity recognition, so we can know that, okay, uh, if this has a tag of, say, uh, Hillary Clinton, then this uh, the named entity recognition would recognize that as an object and the, we'll know that the whole tweet is about that person. Or say that uh, there's a mention of Singapore in a tweet and the named entity recognition would identify Singapore as an entity and then we'll know that the whole tweet talks about Singapore. Singapore. So what are feature vectors? So feature vectors are basically integration of different words in a document into one linear format or vectorized format. So we can uh, develop a model and input it as uh, training vectors. So uh, there's a one very common um, feature vector called as bag of words, which basically uh, which basically considers each word as its own entity and counts the occurrence of words as a matrix, as a metric for how important it is. So say uh, a document has good three times, it would be more positive than a document that has good two times and would, that would be more positive than a document that has good one time. But uh, bag of words doesn't take context into consideration. So uh, say I'm writing a review about a mobile which says the mobile is good but expensive and uh, say I'm take, uh, writing a review about another mobile which is the mobile is expensive but really good. Bag of words would consider each word on its own but the second review is more positive than the first review. It's saying that though it's expensive, it's worth the expense. The first review is saying that, okay, it's good but I don't think it's worth the expense. So bag of words doesn't take context into, into example or into consideration. So what do we do to take context into consideration? We generally use n-dimensional vectors which are usually deployed using word to vec or Glovi. Now word to vec is a deep learning framework developed by Google which basically considers analogical relations and semantic relation between words to give output. So uh, you would have probably heard of an example from Google using word to vec as something which is related to king and uh, is not a man. So what does, uh, like, if we have man to woman, and if we have king to, like, we did analogies in, uh, for 
mental test like king uh, like if we have man to woman and king to we don't know what it is king to question mark so what to where can basically fill in the gap and say that it would be a queen so if we put an input query into word to wake as something which is a king and but is not a woman it would directly deduce it to be a is not a man it would deduce it to be a queen so what word to wake does is it cre it creates a 300 dimensional vector of each of the word and its importance and it takes context into preference so we can directly add or multiply those vectors to know that the relation of words and the placement of words is important we can use a similarity matrix using different composition of words like taking two words into consideration or three words into consideration and those are called as unigrams, bigrams and n-grams. What are the different dictionaries and modules available for sentiment analysis? So uh, the three major ones are Centicnet, um, which is basically a concept mapping of whether a concept is positive or negative like and it is dependent upon when it is said. So say, um, go to bed is a concept. So if I say that as a response to, um, I don't want to go to the party today, I want to go to bed, it's probably a negative response, but uh, I'm feeling fresh today, I went to bed early yesterday, it's probably a positive response. So Centicnet takes that information into consideration and uh, and displays the polarity and the subjectivity of that specific concept. Then there are other basic dictionaries that are usually used. One is Appen and one is SentiWordNet, which uh, SentiWordNet is created using Twitter and has polarity decided by the tweets whether the, uh, that word is positive or negative. Some of the major modules in Python related to sentiment analysis are te is TextBlob and NLTK. A text prop is a module which is uh, useful for people who just want to plug in their sentences and don't want to build a model around sentiment analysis, but actually want to perform sentiment analysis on a small scale related to their probably their startup company or the reviews they are getting or the feedback they are getting on their applications. So text prop is an interface which um, implements a naive-based classifier inside uh, of the module and you just apply it with a sentence and it would re uh, respond to you with two values, one of them being polarity and the other one of them being subjectivity. So the polarity basically means if the value is less than zero, the sentiment is negative. If it is greater than zero, the sentiment is positive. Subjectivity basically means that whether the person thinks uh, is writing their opinion or is writing a fact. So say um, say there's a movie, say there's an app, app review which you have posted on Android and the, there's a sentence which says uh, the application is really slow and is hard to understand. This, might, this would probably be more objective rather than a review which says that the application needs to have features like, the, if, like these and these to make something more comfortable. So this is a person expressing their own opinion, whereas the first one is a fact about the application. So objectivity or subjectivity basically decides how subjective or objective the, the sentiment of a sentence is. So uh, sentiment labeling and classification methods are usually of two types. One is binary labeled and one is multi-labeled. Binary labeled is like you have buckets. You have multi, you have usually have three buckets: positive, neutral, and negative. And then you have a piece of text, and you want to put them into those buckets. So you want to decide: okay, uh, this is positive, this is negative, this is neutral. And you don't you don't want to put them into two buckets at once. You just have to decide: okay, you have to perform an analysis report. So the report would say 70% of them were positive, and 20% were negative and 10% didn't say anything substantial. Whereas multi-label data basically means that you assign probabilities to each one of them being something. So say uh, when you classify them into buckets, it's usually like um, if I'm classifying them into buckets and the uh, it's positive, uh, the, the train data says that it's, uh, the probability of it being positive is 0 0.6. So we'll put it in the positive bucket. 
but we don't know whether it's sufficiently large enough than like say 0.4 so that we can discern it as negative so what basically multi label data does is now uh, they attach multiple tags to the same piece of text so if there's a news report and it can be both angry and sad at the same time say for uh, example an assassination of a but uh, for celebrity can be angry and sad at the same time we don't have to con uh, put it into bucket of okay this text is either angry or this text is either sad the major classification methods that are successful at a preliminary level are bag of words and k nearest neighbors so in k nearest neighbors you cluster the information the training data set into different parts and then you uh, find the minimum distance of the test data set from which uh, from which cluster it is minimum and then assign it to that cluster itself so uh, if we have to build a basic naive based class sentiment analyzer um nltk provides a corpus called as movie reviews so what we basically do is uh, for the first time when we are trying to implement sentiment analysis and trying to see what results it can produce we can uh, probably create a basic sentiment analyzer which gives around 72% of accuracy in around 15 lines or so so what we do is we import the classify uh, module from nltk and we import the movie reviews corpus now um there's a function called as word feeds uh, which is basically word features so what it does is uh, we pass it a list of words and whether that uh, what it does is basically it creates a dictionary of words where <coughs> it it measure, it maps that if a word is present it's true if a word is not present it's false so what it does is for each word in the list it creates a dictionary of word to true or and the rest would be false so now what we do is we uh the movie reviews have a column called as negative and a column uh, has a column called as file ids and when then we extract negative from it and positive from it so negative ids are all the ids of the movies which have negative reviews positive ids are all the ids of the movies which have positive reviews now what we do is we create the feature the bag of word feature from the previous function uh, you and we may create it on the movie reviews words in negative ids and in the positive ids so what negative feature has is word features of movie reviews whose um, whose judgment was negative and what positive features have is a word feature of movie reviews whose judgment was positive now what we do is the negative cut off and positive cut off is basically the cross validation uh, pu for purpose of cross validation so what we do is we consider 75% to be a uh, trained data set and 1 by 4 to be a uh, testing data set so uh, we we'll take the first 75% for training and then we'll test on the later so we train from the we train till the negative feeds plus positive we'll create a vector so the vector would be negative feeds the three fourth of the negative features and plus the three fourth of the positive features and the test features would be the remaining 25% of the negative features plus remaining 25% of the positive features so we basically um, instantiate an object of naive based classifier and send the train uh, features into it like uh, send it as a parameter and then um, the util dot accurate uh, the util class we imported initially like from nltk dot classify dot util it basically has a uh, a purpose of providing precision record and accuracy so what we basically do is we um, send the classifier and the test features the remaining 25% we didn't use to train and uh, calculate the accuracy of it so what it does is basically it uh, gives around 72% of accuracy on a very basic classification system 
and then the, when you uh, show the most informative features in classifier, the movie review corpus has around, uh, as far as I remember, it has around 40 to 45 columns. So what classified or show most informative feature does is whatever columns had the most weight, like the top 10 columns which had the most weightage in deciding or predicting the features of the test values, it shows you that. Now, uh, this is a transparent box algorithm. So you know, like, you can call the show most informative features and can understand which features are, uh, which features are deciding or impacting the decision of whether to use it or not. But when we move towards deep learning and using uh, RCNNs on, for sentiment analysis, we actually lose that basis and then what happens is we don't know what is impacting, but then uh, we have a good prediction. Like the prediction would be uh, above 85%, but we don't know what is impacting the movie review. So as, uh, as the previous talk uh, host said, that if we don't know what is impacting the movie review, then it is not probably of much use to the movie maker. So I can predict the, I can, uh, I can, predict the rating of a user, but then if I can't tell the movie maker that, okay, your, um, your genre is insuitable or the, your target market age group is insuitable, then what use would sentiment analysis be to the person who is actually performing it? So to counter that, uh, we do an aspect-based sentiment analysis where we find the accuracy on each aspect, and then there's a, there's a type of sentiment analysis, or basically use a sentiment analysis, which decides the stance towards a topic. So uh, say a topic of uh, nuclear power plants in a country, and there's a huge amount of future data set on it, so you want to know what the public thinks, the government wants to know what the public thinks, and what are their major concerns over nuclear power plants in the country. That is called a stance prediction. Uh, there's something called as plotting happiness in m like movies, scripts, uh, books, how the happiness goes over, over world, over geographic locations. Uh, there's a very popular work called as Hedgenometer related to it. I'll show it in a moment. Uh, the, then uh, there have been work on predicting stock market fluctuations related to how the Twitter was responding to, say, a company going public. So if, a com if the Twitter is responding very well to a company going public, you should probably buy that stock because the stock prices would uh, rise in a few days. And say that if the Twitter uh, Twitch, um, Twitch is usually a very good data set for uh, people to perform research on, firstly because it is public, secondly because people try to be just on the point of what they want to say because it is limited to 140 characters. You don't have to go around the whole t uh, text and prune the text to know what they want to say. And then uh, there has been a work called as creating musical pieces for novels related to the sentiment. So what the people, what they, that research group basically wants to do is say you are an amazing and you can't read the book, you can't read the first chapter of the book, so you'll have a musical file which tells you whether, um, the, whether the emotions in the book are negative or how the emotions flow in the book, whether they go from positive to negative to positive to negative, and does the book end on a happy note or does the book end on a sad note, and then probably on the mood you are in, you can probably buy that book. I'll show you the link to Hedonometer. So this is Hedonometer and then this is their recent work which say uh, which actually plots the average happiness on Twitter related to their days. So you can see that the Orlando shootings were somewhere here which is below uh, which is far below than Mother's Day and then uh, death of Muhammad Ali was somewhere here. So this way you can recognize the reaction uh, or sentiment of the world at large related to some particular events and then you can know how how the people react to some particular things, how they react to some ideas. Um, there are some things like 
Um, there are some anomalies in this process, like there's FIFA here, uh, which probably shouldn't be lower on the average axis. So this is what we try to curb, like uh, this shouldn't be low, but probably the people on, uh, when they talk about FIFA, they always talk about this team should lose or this, uh, uh, the, they, when a study is done on Twitter about sports, uh, people tend to say negative about other teams more than positive about their own. So they would rather say that Ronaldo is of no use rather than saying that Messi is a great player. So um, that's why FIFA always tends to lead to negative results rather than uh, leading to positive results in support of teams. There is some... So they have a work on... Exploring happiness in books. So the most popular book would be Harry Potter. So what they calculate is if they create a time series of the novel, like from the start, initial to the end, how does the happiness go? Does like it starts from an okay high and goes to a very high level in between, and then goes to okay high and then ends on a neutral mode. So this is what they use it for. And then there is research that. Uh, creates a plot of this, and then you can actually relate these plots to the success of novels along with authors and other variables at task. So this is one another feature you can add to the to the presentation. Um. Uh, this is what I have been working on in um, in the research assistantship I'm doing right now. So. Uh, it is basically used to add sentiment and emotion to healthcare. So um, probably all of you would have heard the news of Amazon adding emotion recognition cues to the eco model assistant it has. So uh, what it basically does it is when you talk to your virtual assistant, it uh, recognizes the clues in your voice and it recognizes the pitch and the modulation compared to your original modulation. And then what it does is it responds how you, to how you're feeling. So say uh, when you ask it, what do I, what should I eat? Um, when you're in a good mood, it would probably say you should eat healthy food. But when you are, when it recognizes that you are in a bad mood, it would probably recommend you to eat two tubs of Ben and Jerry's ice cream. <laughs> Uh, so um, then there is one uh, did, um, particular use of uh, sentiment in healthcare, which is regarding uh, stances amongst general public in uh, healthcare policies, especially about abortion. So uh, the most popular Republican and Democrat debate is about whether abortion should be legalized or should not be legalized. So that's what it's used for. Um, it is used to predict personality, and uh, it has been proven that a computer can predict a personality from your online footprints far better than any person can predict your personality. And then uh, the particular case I'm working on is to predict and discern cases of depression among social media users. So how do you know that if a person is tweeting this or, uh, or a particular set of tweets, that person might be depressed or that person might need... Uh, social intervention or that person should be referred to a societal helpline. So there has been work done on it which uh, which has been um, so uh, the, I think this work is of 2014 so it says a 70 percent accuracy from where uh, the Twitter model can predict if you are depressed and you should see a psychologist. Uh, the model is basically uh, now at around 81% to which it can predict uh, whether you are socially depressed or whether you should see a psychologist or not. And it's an interdisciplinary field where, uh, where basically, according as to my father says, the psychologists work with us to remove their professions. So basically, it has been proven far ahead in psychology that people are more inclined to speak to computers because computers wouldn't judge them, and computers have no liability of revealing the information to anyone under any um, 
under any blackmail condition so computer would be completely non judgmental about them so people would like to speak to computer so if the computer can predict the if computer can predict whether a person is depressed or needs uh, needs medication then people would rather prefer to talk to computers rather than a psychologist so back to this comic again uh, that is what we are trying to do so if the person is talking this way to a psychologist uh, we actually the most important and the most um, tedious job is to know that the that kelvin is actually saying that he likes her rather than he doesn't like her thank you So uh, basically the whole training set is classified into uh, clusters and the clusters are decided say uh, you model the clusters from um, usually from 5 to 15 and decide which uh, clustering is the best the f score metric is used to define like uh, if the model is accurate or not so uh, with Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, if we have K and we uh, usually use. Uh, so, so if it is K and your neighbors, we plot it on a coordinate system, and the distance between the the centroid of that cluster and where the word occurs on a two. Uh, on a coordinate distance is the coordinate distance between the centroid and the word occurrence is it the coordinate where the word occurs no, 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 the of the cluster so it's a x y coordinate value so they are like Uh, okay so uh, the the numbers are usually either yes the numbers that i plot on x and y so uh, that can be anything from uh, the um the frequency of the words say this is a word and this is a word and that frequency from the frequency to uh, when we use word to vec and glo v it creates a dimensional vector and then we do not plot it on a two uh, two coordinate axis then we actually find the distance between two vectors so when we are doing it basically using bag of words uh, it is the frequency it's like the histogram so uh, like if a word occurs uh, thrice in a document it would be at three position from here and then if it occurs this way so it and then when it's clustered so say it's clustered as as this way and then we find the centroid and then another word occurs and then we find the frequency of that word occurrence and then we can create the centroid uh, the distance from the centroid of the cluster any other language other than english so if i have to perform sentiment analysis in other languages i will first have to know of the other language uh, properly that what each sentence implies in that language and i'm not uh, good at any other language other than english so have you tried any other library like ac or anything else apart from it and uh, no uh, what we usually do is uh, we begin with this but then when we uh, start implementing uh, deep learning and tensor flow uh, because these don't give a good accuracy so we directly jump from nltk to implementation of deep learning and then trying to find like the features in the black box
any other questions.